when we do statistical analysis, we always get the point estimate or the estimate of the effect, just one regression coefficient or one number. We also need to know how certain we are about that number and that certainty is quantified by the standard error. So that standard error quantifies the precision and we use the standard error and the actual estimate to calculate test statistics that give us the p-values. Some, in some scenarios calculating the standard error is hard or calculating the standard error is something that requires assumptions that we are not willing to make or assumptions that we know that they are not true for our particular data and analysis. Bootstrapping provides an alternative way of calculating standard errors or estimating how much a statistic would vary from one sample to another. And bootstrapping is like a computational approach to the problem of calculating a standard error. How bootstrapping works is that we have our original sample. So we have a sample of 10 observations here from a, a normally distributed population with mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So that's our original sample here. The mean is 0 0.13 from that sample. And if we take uh, multiple samples from the same population, here is uh, the sampling distribution of the, of the sample mean if the sample size is 10 from this population. Most of the time we get values close to the zero, which is the population value of, of mean. And then uh, we have some, sometimes we get estimates that are far from, uh, from the actual population value. The idea of, of bootstrapping is that if we don't know how we estimate this, uh, the width of this sampling distribution or the shape using statistical theory or a closed form equation, then we can do that empirically. So instead of uh, calculating it using an equation, we take repeated samples from our original sample. So that's our original sample. It forms the population for the bootstrap. Then we take a, a repeated sample. So we take first uh, 0 0.31, it is uh, here. Then we take, we put it back. So we allow mo every observation to include it, be included in the sample multiple times. Then we take randomly another, another one 0 0.83, it's here. We put it back. Then we take yet another number, yet another number. We take the 0 .0, minus 0 0.84 the second time and so on. So we take these, these samples from an original data and every observation can be included in the, in the sample multiple times. So each of these uh, randomly chosen numbers doesn't depend on any, any other previous choices. So we get uh, using this bootstrap sample we get 0 0.34 as sample mean. We calculate it many many times, typically we do 100, 500 or 1000 times or even 10,000 times depending on the complexity of the calculation. 1000 repetitions is, is quite normal nowadays. So we can see that from sample to sample this um, sample mean varies and this uh, variance of sample mean calculated or the distribution of this sample mean from the bootstrap samples calculated from uh, 1000 bootstrap replications here is about the same shape as that if we would take the samples from the actual population. So these two are distributions are quite similar and we can use that information, the knowledge that these two distributions are similar, they, they approach each other when the sample size increases. We can use that knowledge to, to say that this uh, distribution here is a good representation of that distribution and if we want to estimate the standard deviation of this distribution, which is what standard error quantifies or estimates, then uh, we can just use the standard deviation of that distribution. Here we can see that the mean of this distribution is slightly off. That's called the bootstrap bias. So this mean here is roughly at the mean here. So it's not at the population mean, in, instead of it's, it's closer to the, uh, the mean of this particular sample. Then we, uh, there also the width of this distribution is in this case slightly smaller. So the dispersion here is slightly smaller than the dispersion here. And that is also uh, something that we in some times need to take into consideration. The, the key thing in bootstrapping is that once sample size increases, then this mean and this standard deviation will be closer to the, that mean and that standard deviation. Let's take a, a look at a demonstration of how bootstrapping works. This is a video from, uh, from a statistics department from uh, University of Auckland and uh, 
they demonstrate that you have your original sample here. So we have two variables. We have uh, the uh, x variable and the y variable. And then we have a regression coefficient. So we calculate the regression coefficient here. And we are interested in how much this regression coefficient, the slope would vary if we were to take this sample over and over from the same population. So that's what the standard error quantifies. For some reason, we don't want to use the, the normal formula that our statistical software uses to calculate the standard error. We want to do it by bootstrapping. So we, we take some samples from our original data. So we take samples from the original data, like so. You can see uh, here that each observation can be included multiple times. Sometimes an observation is not included in the sample. Then we get the regression coefficient that is slightly different from, from the, the, the original one. We do another bootstrap sample, we get another regression coefficient, again slightly different from the original one. We take yet another bootstrap sample. We get slightly different one. And we go on a hundred times, a thousand times, and ultimately we get an estimate of how much this regression coefficient would really vary if we were to take multiple different samples. So that's, uh, that's when you get uh, a thousand samples or a hundred samples. Then you can see that uh, the variance of the regression coefficient is, is that much uh, between the bootstrap samples and if sample size is large enough, this variation of the bootstrap samples is a good approximation of how much the regression coefficient would vary if we were to repeat the same independent samples from the same population and calculate the regression analysis again and again from those independent samples. Bootstrapping it can be used to calculate the standard error, which in which case we just uh, take a standard deviation of these regression slopes and then that is our standard error estimate. We can also use bootstrapping to calculate confidence intervals. So the idea of a confidence interval is that uh, instead of estimating a, a standard error and a p-value, we estimate a, a point estimate. So for example, a value of a correlation, one single value, and then we estimate uh, an interval, let's say 95% interval, which has an upper limit and lower limit. And then if we repeat the, the calculation many, many times from independent samples, then the population value will be within the interval, if it's a valid interval, 95% of the times. So this is an example of a correlation and uh, we can see that the correlation estimates when there is uh, zero correlation in the population, we have a small sample size, they vary between 0 point, minus 0 0.2 and plus 0 0.2. And um, most of the time when we draw the confidence interval, which is the, the, uh, the line here, the line includes the population value. This is two and a half percent of the replications here and it doesn't include the population value. So uh, the population value here falls above the, uh, the upper limit. Here we have extremely large correlations and the population value for about two and a half percent of the replications falls up below the lower limit. In 95 percent of the cases here, the uh, population value is within the interval. So that's uh, the idea of confidence intervals. Here we can see that when the population value is large, then the, the width of the confidence interval depends on the correlation estimate. So when the correlation estimate is very high, then the, uh, the confidence interval is, is narrow. When the correlation estimate is very low, then uh, it's a lot wider here, the, uh, the confidence interval. So the confidence interval depends on, on the value of the statistic and also it depends on uh, the estimated standard error of the statistic. Now there are a couple of ways that bootstrapping can be used for calculating a confidence interval. In normally when we do confidence intervals we use the normal approximation. So the idea is that uh, we assume that the estimate is normally distributed over repeated samples. Then we calculate the confidence interval. It is a uh, estimate plus or minus 1.96 which covers 95 percent of the normal uh, distribution multiplied by the standard error. So that gives us the plus or minus. 
So if we have an estimate of correlation that is here, then we multiply the standard error of, of by 1.96 minus estimate minus that is, is the lower limit estimate plus 1.9 times the standard error is here. So that gives us the upper and lower limit. In this example, 1% uh, and 13% when the actual estimate is about 5%. Uh, so we calculate how we use bootstrapping for this calculation is that the, the, the standard error is simply the standard deviation of the bootstrap estimate. So if we take a correlation, we bootstrap it, then we calculate how much the correlation varies between the bootstrap samples using standard deviation metric. And then we use that plug, that, plug that into that formula, gives us the confidence intervals. So that works when we can assume that the estimate is normally distributed. What if we can't assume that the estimates are normal? That is the case when we are, can use empirical confidence intervals based on bootstrapping. So the idea of, of um, the normal approximation interval is that the estimate is normally distributed, then we can use this equation or we can use empirical confidence intervals. The idea of an empirical confidence interval is that we, re we do the bootstrapping and then we, let's say we take a thousand bootstrap replications, then we take the 25th from smallest to largest, we take the 25th uh, value of the bootstrap replicates and that is our lower limit for the confidence interval. Then we take the 975th and that is uh, the upper limit. So th that's uh, two and a half percent and 97 and a half percent. And that's the upper limit of our, our confidence interval. So that's called percentile intervals. So when we have this kind of bootstrap distribution, we would take a uh, replication here, the 25th replication, that is our lower limit. And we take the 975th replication here, that is our upper limit. So that gives us the confidence interval for the mean that is estimated here. That has two problems, this approach. First, uh, the bootstrap distribution is biased. So uh, the mean of these uh, bootstrap replications is about 0 0.15 and the actual sample value for the mean is zero. To account for that bias, we have a bias corrected confidence intervals. The idea of bias corrected confidence intervals is that instead of taking the 25th, a 975th bootstrap replicate as the endpoints, we first estimate how much the bootstrap bias is. And then uh, based on that estimate, we take, for example, the 40th and 980th replication. So instead of taking the fixed 25th and fixed 975th, we adjust which, uh, in which replicate, replicates we take as the endpoints. There is also the problem that uh, the variance, the standard deviation here, is not always the same as the standard deviation of here. So in, in the correlation example, you, you saw that the, co the confidence interval decreased as the uh, actual correlation estimate went up. So uh, the idea is that uh, the width of the interval depends on the value of the estimate. To take that into account, we have uh, bias corrected and, and accelerated confidence intervals, which apply the same idea as the bias corrected ones. But instead of just taking the bias into account, they take the, uh, the estimated differences in variance of these two distributions into account when they choose the, uh, when we choose the endpoints for the, uh, the confidence interval. Now the question is, this, this looks uh, really good. So we can estimate uh, the variance of any any statistic empirically and we don't have to know the math and yeah that's basically it's it's true with some qualifications the qualifications are that uh bootstrapping requires large sample size there is a good article or a book chapter by by koopman and, and co-authors in in the book edited by vanderberg about statistical myths and urban legends and uh, they point out that there are three different claims made in the literature. There's the claim that bootstrapping works well in small samples. And there's a there is a fact that bootstrapping assumes that sample is representative of the population. So if our sample is very different from the population, then 
the bootstrap samples that we take from our original sample cannot approximate how the samples would actually behave from the real population. Then our sampling error, which means how, how different the sample is from the population, is, uh, is troublesome in small samples. So in small samples, the sample may not be a very accurate representation of the population. So if, if small samples are not representative of the population, and if we require that sample is must be representative of the population, then bootstrapping cannot work in small samples. So bootstrapping generally requires a large sample size. Then there are also some boundary conditions under which bootstrapping doesn't work even if you have a large sample. So there are that kind of scenarios. But for most practical applications, uh, only the sample size is the thing that you need to be concerned about. The problem is that it is very hard to say when your sample size is large enough. 